everything that we do from our customer evaluations to the technology that we build to the roadmaps that we have everything converges with one thing in mind and that's to serve you the customer sharewell provides enterprise power without the, the cost and complexity i've got a system that i can customize with little training. Never have to write a line of code and never need a developer level resource to touch the tool. Having this portal and being able to integrate it with our existing SharePoint sites and being able to provide on-demand reports and searches. Anything that you can conceive of that you need to automate and integrate, you can build. Within days of receiving the product, it was plugged into our virtual environment. It's a game changer. Most of our competition, you'll find out, is built on old, legacy technology. We can get you up and running as quickly as possible and yet you'll never outgrow us. Our software and our technology was built on the latest, most innovative technology available today. Whether you have it on-premise and bring it into our hosted environment or take it from our hosted environment and bring it on-premise, it doesn't matter. It's about people at ShareWell. It's in the relationships that we build. At the end of the meeting, he turned to me and he says, you guys have got the deal. And I said, well, why? What, what made the difference? And he says, it's, it's the way Sherwell treated us. We don't get it right every time. We listened, we identified the problem, and then we worked through the solution together. You need to be worried about your legacy. Your legacy is based upon the tools and the people that you employ and how cost-effective and what the quality is. So keeping this simple and not expensive and easy to maintain saves you a lot. Hello, my name is Mark Fay from Sharewell Software. We're a proud sponsor of TFT 2014, bringing great ITSM content to the world. Please enjoy this next presentation. Hello, everybody. And Hi, I'm coming to you from the Bellagio in Las Vegas, like a number of presenters have been doing at this uh, TFT conference. And so talking to you today about slow IT, which is my favorite topic this year. It's something I'm very passionate about and getting a little bit evangelical about spreading the message. I've already presented it here at the Pink Elephant Conference and today I'm bringing it to you. So uh, slow IT is an idea around uh, a way we need to fundamentally change the, the relationship between IT and the rest of the organization. So I'll talk about three things today. The challenges that we're facing in IT, I know everyone does that, but there's some fundamental ones around what I call real IT that I want to address today. And then uh, what I think is one of the key parts of the solution, which is slow IT, which we'll talk about and then the opportunities that slow IT present to us, which I can characterize as fast IT and uh, the strategy of meeting in the middle with the rest of the organization um, to get them to agree to this whole idea of slow IT, which is not easy. So I'm talking today about what I call real IT. And I, I'm doing that because the word IT is one of those terms that gets debased and used in all sorts of contexts to mean um, anything that people want it to mean. So uh, real IT, I'm talking about information technology being used inside an organization to enable that organization to full its, fulfill its function, where its function is not necessarily IT, or in fact, it's not IT in general. So manufacturing organizations, government departments, I don't care what they are, real IT is IT within the organization enabling the organization. And so people who sell IT or sell IT services or sell software for IT, that's not IT. Uh, personal IT that you carry around with you, um, that's not IT. Consumer IT, it's not IT. I'm talking about real IT. Good old people doing IT within an organization. And in that context, I think IT exists to protect and to serve. So we're talking about a, a delicate balance between the two priorities that IT is tasked with. IT is the 
custodian of the immense investment in information and technology, information and the technology to manage that and manipulate that information within an organization. And we're the stewards of that. We are accountable for the information technology. And so we, we exist to protect, but we also exist, ex exist to serve, to meet the needs of the organization to, um, to move forward. So primarily we're talking about change when we say to serve. New services changes the services. That's right. But we're there to protect and serve. And that means that we're doing this balancing act between what is quite often conflicting priorities in real IT. Um, you know, when we serve, when we change, we put what we're supposed to protect at risk. So um, there's a balance between value and risk going on all the time when we protect and serve. And that risk shows itself in a number of ways. And one of the ways that I see when I when I talk to clients and, and um, you know, go around and hear about various organizations is that we're drowning in projects. So uh, this will resonate with a lot of people in the audience this call. Not everybody. I mean, these are broad sweeping generalizations and I know not, not every organization is drowning in IT projects, but it sure is a common phenomenon that We've got so many projects on that we barely know how to, to spread our resource across them, how to fulfill them. We're flat out doing, um, doing projects. And that is putting the stuff that we're supposed to protect at risk. It's stretching our capacity to maintain the existing investment in information and technology. And so this pressure I think is is a is a fundamental risk to IT. IT is as going as fast as IT can go in a lot of organizations. The horse is flat out. It's at full stretch, it's at full gallop. The people are exhausted, they're they're in shock, they're they're um they're at their wits end. Um, there's a lot of strain on IT departments to meet the current demands and we're just seeing those escalate we're seeing the, the the pace escalate and we're seeing the complexity escalate and we're seeing the sheer number of demands from the organization escalate and we're flat out we're struggling to meet those so um this is a this is a an absolutely critical and fundamental issue to the organization and we're seeing all sorts of spin-off phenomena from that like um shadow it of course where um you know, the business is going out and doing its own thing through frustrations with IT. And we're challenged to try and minimize the risk to the organization from things that we don't even have control over. Difficult. So I think that one of the real key pieces to addressing this issue is governance of IT. I think that there isn't enough of it that there are many organizations that are not governing their IT. So um, there's a standard for governance of IT, ISO 38500, and it's called corporate governance of IT. And the most important word in that whole standard is in the title of that standard. And the most important word in the title of that standard is of, because governance, it's corporate governance of IT. Governance is not done by IT. Governance is done to IT. And you might have governance and enablement practices that, that go on within IT, which are managerial practices. They're not governance practices. You might have managerial practices to meet the needs of the governors, but governance is done by governors. And we've really got to get to understand that concept because it's not well understood. So uh, I think that one of the fundamentals that we need to put in place is governance of IT. So I'll just go over to my presentation for you now, if I can. And um, governance is key to this whole thing that we need to have some. I, it's, there's so many organizations I go to where, where, where it's missing and there's so many stories I, he, I hear where if you analyze that story, um, then you can hear that, that, that 
it's one of the key causes to the, to the horror story you're hearing is a lack of governance of IT. With better governance of IT, the governors have to understand their responsibilities with respect to IT, and they must understand the risks to the organization of the demands that they're making on IT. They have to have a, uh, an articulate discussion with IT, with IT behaving as a trusted advisor so that the governors can understand and they can make informed decisions about the demands that they put on IT. And if we can do effective governance of IT, then we'll make better decisions on new projects and new ideas that come out of the business and whether or not they are fulfillable. We can um, hopefully uh, reduce some of the demand for, for projects within IT and we can manage some of the shadow IT, which um, I believe absolutely shouldn't be happening. I'm not against distributed IT. I'm not against business units doing their own thing, but they have to do that within the same frame of references as IT performed by the IT department. There has to be overall governance of IT across the organization, just like there's overall governance of money. So a business unit isn't allowed to go off and do their own money thing and borrow money without reference to the chief financial officer. And equally, they shouldn't be allowed to do their own IT without reference to the CIO. Now the key, a mechanism, I keep saying the key, one of the important mechanisms by which uh, the governors engage with IT is service portfolio. So service portfolio, you know, those of you who have been wondering why the service strategy book is there, why the Eiffel Green book exists, you can go and read it now, um, because service portfolio is this really important mechanism by which we can have that conversation with the governors and intelligent discussion with them. Because the portfolio looks at everything from the, the initial demand for services through the projects to, to implement and enable those services to the catalog of run of the services that we are, that are, that are in production, that are BAU and, and retirement of services. And it's only by having a holistic view across the service portfolio not project and program portfolio, but service portfolio, and managing our resources holistically across both change and run, that we can have a sensible conversation about what IT has the capacity to deliver and what the organization has the capacity to deliver. Now that's really important, getting that holistic view across projects and catalog to protect what's in the catalog, and serve what's required in the demand of the projects and getting that balance between the two. But we've got some issues that, that make that hard. Um, one of those is expectation setting within the organization. So there's some, some hideous things that are giving unrealistic expectations of IT within organizations, with the users, the customers, the executive management, the governors, they're all having this personal digital experience where they walk around with their smartphone and, and anytime they want a new app, they install a new app. And anytime they want to upgrade their phone to another phone, they just upgrade to another phone. And anytime they're looking at which phone to buy, you know, the, they've effectively got unlimited resource to decide which phone they want. You know, well, do I spend that extra hundred dollars? No problem, I'm gonna do it. And, and this, whether they subconsciously, whether they realize it or not, this is setting an expectation in their minds that IT is easy. The, you know, if I can do it with my phone, what's so hard with you guys with the mainframe? So that's one issue that this non real IT stuff in the personal digital experience gives us this hideously distorted view of what should be possible and what I call real IT. And the other paradigm that, that screws everything for us is the mega online retail paradigm. So this is the old, um, you ought to have a service catalog that looks like Amazon. If Amazon can do it, your service catalog can do it. Um, you ought to have customer service levels the same as Apple. Everybody should have a genius bar. You know, this stuff is, is pure crystalline crap, sorry, but the, what, what a multi-billion dollar organization who, that lives or dies on keeping its retail sales up, what they do with their online interface has no useful information for me in terms of how I run my real IT. 
simple as that. And we've, this has got to stop. The other big expectational thing that, that drives us crazy is the, is the competition card that, that, oh, we have to do this to compete. We have to be first to market or die. You know, the, the, the competition drives everything. And that's true in some organizations. I'll tell you what, it's not true at all. And, and that premise, that assumption needs to be seriously examined anytime that card gets played to try and overrule IT or steamroll IT into doing something. Overall, I think we're overheating. I think um, not every organization wants to ne or needs to change at the breakneck speed that our IT industry thinks we do. And this is driven um, by all sorts of things. It's driven by America's fixation, the whole frenzy that that induces. It's driven by the vendors pumping this stuff into us. Um, it, it, it's driven by this whole cult of competitiveness. It's driven by the entrepreneurial startup co culture centered in the west coast of America, whose language and ethos is, is, is infecting all through the thinking around all sorts of IT. You know, you don't need to pivot all the time. Their language is popping up everywhere and is driving thinking, I think, as a broad sweeping generalization. IT is overheating and we all need to just chill a little. Um, there's a, a few fundamentals here that get overlooked, get lost, that people just, just lose sight of, um, that are going to make us change, make us slow down, whether we like to or not. And one of those I call the human rate of change. Technology can change at this blinding pace. I don't deny that, and, and, and it's great. But there is a finite, a very finite pace at which individuals, teams, organizations, or overall communities and cultures can change. And that human rate of change is measured in years. And we've lost sight of that. I really think we've lost sight of that. We've got to come back to the understanding that you can only change the way people work, function, behave, think at a very, very finite pace. Another fundamental that we lose sight of is um, this, the way that we forecast into the future by extrapolating exponential curves. You know, how many, Moore's law is, is, is one of these. Um, the, but there's all these others about, you know, oh, wow, man, things are going so fast that in 20 years time, we're gonna merge with the machines or, or there's gonna be a singularity and the machines will outpace us and all this other, um, I want to think of a polite word that um, that we hear. It's all based on extrapolation of exponential curves, and that's a fallacy. That that that's the only word for it. It's a fundamental fallacy. Anybody who understands systems theory and anybody who has worked with systems in the real world knows that the real world doesn't work that way. In the real world, every exponentially increasing curve meets some sort of physically countervailing constraining factor at some point and it rolls off to an asymptote. It just does. Okay? It just does. This is the world. Now I know Moore's law has just kicked into another generation and it looks like it's still screaming up, but there will come a point. There will come a point where the operating temperature of a chip exceeds the internal temperature of the sun if you extrapolate the curve far enough. That's got to roll off, okay? There is a limit to everything. There is particularly a limit to curves that involve humans because of what I just said before with human rate change. But any curve that is roaring away from us now, it is an absolute fallacy to think it will continue to roar away at that pace. So I think we all need to just calm down a little bit. IT in a lot of organizations, as I said, is at a limit. It's flat out. It just can't go any faster. Um, Barclay Ray talked to me just before for uh, he was doing a little video clip, and he said, "Well, what about when the business absolutely has to? What about when you know there are these these market constraints or competitive constraints or organisational constraints to say, well, we just have to do this? Well, I think the answer is that sometimes we just can't. You know, if they go to the CFO and say," 
uh, we want to do this acquisition of this external company and the CFO says, well, we just don't have that much money and there is no feasible way that I can find to raise that much finance in the market with our current position because of blah, 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 blah. They all nod sagely and take his advice and say, yep, we understand that. We don't have the money to make that acquisition. But when they go to the CIO and say, we're going to make this acquisition, we're going to merge the IT and it needs to be merged within three months, you know, and the CIO says, well, that just simply isn't possible. Everyone goes, you whining IT people, go and make it so. And, 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 and I don't understand why information isn't treated as such a, an equally fundamental resource as money and is given the same respect and, as I say, governance. So what we need to do is we need to do slow IT. And I'm not talking about uh, we need to do our job as IT slower. I'm saying we need to slow down the rate at which demand is coming into IT. We need to slow down the rate at which the business is placing demands on its internal IT function, its real IT. And it's only by slowing down that we will give IT the, cap the, the, the headroom, the capacity to make the changes that we need to make in order to become faster at the rest of that cycle, faster at projects, more nimble and agile in the way we run our production catalog, our run. Now, this message, this message that we need to slow down our demands on IT from the organization, it's not going to go down well. So we face a message barrier where this could be a tough sell. And I understand that, I'm, I'm, you know, if it was easy, then we would have done it, right? So what can we do to get this message across to the people that need to get this message? There's a whole bunch of strategies that we can do to drive this. We can keep bang, banging on like a, you know, repeating like a broken record. That's not wrong. We should keep telling the story and hope that one day someone will hear. I think the big, one of the biggest things we can do is, um, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. So be ready when there is a crisis. So when they do thrash IT so hard that it falls flat on its face or when some business unit goes off and does IT all on their lonesome and then suddenly loses all their data or, or causes a privacy prosecution of our organization or something like that. When the board turns around and says, this must never happen again, we have to be ready to whip out the paperwork to say, well, absolutely, we agree. And you know what we need to, in order to prevent this from happening again, we need an effective governance framework in place. We need policy enforced across the enterprise. We need IT to be empowered to manage the critical components of IT that should never be distributed across the organization. For example, compliance assurance, if it was a privacy issue or something like that. We need to be ready with the story, with the mechanisms to, to hand to the board to say, this is what you do to prevent such a crisis from ever happening again. We have to be careful how we present the story to executive management and and IT's peers and to the governors. Just to not say you're idiots, you're doing it badly, which is what my um, uh, bad parents presentation and paper talks about. So that's not a message that you sell up with. Um, we need to not say you've been doing it wrong. We need to say here is how in the future we can do it better. We need to educate the CIO so that the CIO understands this, if whoever's listening is not CIO, so that when they get opportunities, when they get existing communications opportunities to talk to the board and to executive management, that they take those opportunities to say, this is what we in IT need from you in order to engage effectively. We need governance, we need a service portfolio management. One and this this one a lot of people don't like and it goes down quite badly with some people. I think ensure the auditors ask the right questions, which is another way of saying whistleblow to the auditors. So the auditors, IT auditors should be saying, 
how do you get policy directives from the board and executive management? And then if you can honestly turn to them and say, well, actually we don't, then any auditor who knows what they're doing should be flagging that as a failure of governance, for example. So make sure the auditors are asking the right questions and the right questions are defined in COVID-5, so it's not hard for them. Um, have a look at BISL as a framework, Business Information Services Library. Um, you can find that. Uh, that is a framework that looks at some of the, the interlocks between IT and the rest of the business. Um, ultimately, the end game that we're working for is to become a trusted advisor. That, that we need to get to a position where the governance framework recognises the importance of getting IT's opinion as a trusted advisor whenever the decisions and gives us the respect that a CFO gets when they want to know about the money implications of whatever they're doing. Now, there needs to be a quid pro quo, a, a what's in it for me when we ask for the slow IT, when we try and persuade them that they need to slow down the demands a bit. And so if I call that fast IT, so boss, you have to let up on IT because there's a huge risk to the organization. It's going to break soon. We're accruing enormous technical debt. We're, fa you know, we're struggling to meet the demands you're placing on us now. We can see even higher demands coming in future. Boss, you've got to, got to, got to ease up a bit and slow down, slow IT. But in return, if you give us that headroom, that will give us the capability to make some of the improvements we want to make in IT in order to be more responsive and to be more agile and nimble um, for you. So the, 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 the deal is give us slow IT and we'll give it you fast IT. So slow IT is about slowing down the demand that flows from the organization for new and changed services. Fast IT is about using the headroom, the bandwidth, the breathing space that we get from slow IT to be able to make some of the, the improvements that we want to make in order to be able to do fast IT in terms of doing projects and rolling them into business as usual and making business as usual as responsive and nimble as we possibly can. And that's what I mean by meet in the middle. That's the compromise. You slow up, we'll speed up. So what do I mean by fast IT? I mean a whole bunch of things, any of any or all of these things here and other things as well that are um, ways that we can speed up our, our, our ability to deliver IT, both delivering change and delivering uh, run. So at the simplest level, optimization, good old CSI, who has time for CSI? Uh, but you can't just sort of automatically start doing CSI. CSI is a thing that needs to be, um, you know, thought about and, and a bit of effort put into implementing a CSI program if you don't have one now. So getting better at CSI takes effort. Standard change is another one. Um, standard changes are a great way of accelerating change in an organization, but it takes time to recognize and encapsulate and formalize every new type of standard change. And so who has the bandwidth to do that? And quite often you see changes roaring through that really ought to be standard changes, but no one has the time to make them standard changes. And then in, in increasing levels of complexity and importance, um, some of these other ones. So, sorry, I'll, I've got, have got slides for these. So optimization, you know, the little steps, incremental improvement, the putting a program in place to do that, standard change, starting to encapsulate and bottle those things, um, lean. So uh, Lean's great, you know, Kaizen's great. Wouldn't we all love to put in place to do a Lean, uh, do some Lean workshops and, and, and recognize uh, some Lean opportunities and put a Kaizen program in place? Wouldn't we all love to do that? But it takes bandwidth, it takes resource. We can't just do it in our spare time or our day jobs. So these kind of things slip or, or just never ever happen. We need the headroom to be able to do something like Lean. Or outsourcing, you know, you, you know, yes, outsourcing takes a whole lot of pressure out of you, and you can outsource a mess sometimes, or, you know, just take away things that you shouldn't be concentrating your resource on. But it doesn't happen 
instantaneously and magically. It takes a lot of effort and work to put an outsourcing arrangement in place. It takes a lot of effort and work even to find a commodity cloud provider of storage and move your storage into that. That doesn't just happen. So we need the headroom, the space to be able to do this stuff and retire and replace. There are a lot of systems that are zombie systems that are still there for the sole reason that we've never had the time and the resource to have a look at the implications of retiring them and, and capturing what we need to capture out of them before we retire them and managing the impact on the business and all those sort of things. So that's another opportunity that goes begging if the horse is running flat out. Agile is fantastic, you know, if we can do it, but once again, putting it in place, building the skills, building the infrastructure, building the capacity within the organization to do agile doesn't just happen by itself. And it may be the extreme uh, example is DevOps. You know, um, I think DevOps has potential, I get in trouble for saying this, I think it has potential in a number of contexts within IT to offer us some really good ideas and teach us some stuff and to allow us to do some things a lot better. I think in real IT that I've been talking about, it's not transformational and it's not going to change the world. And and there will be some stuff that just doesn't change in, in with what DevOps has to offer. But I think it's really important that we all understand that DevOps and that we understand the value in it and that we apply it where we can. So I um, encourage you to read this book here, The Phoenix Project. Um, I also encourage you to read the review of it on my blog as a Kool-Aid antidote after you've read the Phoenix Project because it is a little bit um, idealistic, but it has it is rich with some really fundamental ideas around DevOps and Agile and what they call the three ways um, of optimizing, which are in the book. So um, there's a lot to learn from this book, a tremendous amount, and I commend it to you. Um, so that's what I mean when I talk about fast IT. I'm talking about all these things I've listed from the simplest things like CSI to the most uh, esoteric things like DevOps and everything in between and some other things I'm sure that I haven't listed here. All the things we'd love to do to do IT better, but we just don't get the opportunity because we're just so busy. We're just so busy trying to fulfill all these extraordinary demands that are laid on us by the business. And so I beseech you, I think it's really fundamental, I think it's an issue we're all wrestling with, is we need to address this issue of real IT in the real IT context, where we're just trying to do IT within an organization to fulfill its capacity to deliver its, its, its outcomes that it desires as an organization, that we have to get the governors of the organization and the decision makers in the organization and our peers in the organization to understand what real IT means, to understand this fundamental principle that we're there to both protect and serve. We can't just be serving all the time. We have an obligation to be the custodians to what is a multi-million dollar or sometimes multi-billion dollar investment that the organization has made in its existing information and its existing technology to manage and manipulate and make accessible and extract value from that information. So yeah, we'd love to serve, but we also need to protect, help us to maintain this balance as in, in our role within the organization. And to get that message across, we need effective governance of IT. And as a really fundamental part of that, we need effective service portfolio management to allow us to articulate that conversation with the governors and the executive, to allow them to understand the issues that we're grappling with, to be able to communicate, to open up that communication. And if we have effective service portfolio management, then we can get across this idea of slow IT. We can communicate to them the current risk that the horse is flat out and it's about to die soon. And we can explain to them that you can't change horses at a gallop, that you know, that in order to do outsourcing or anything, we need we still need to ease down a little bit and get some time to look at those options. We can try and get them to come on board with the idea of slow IT. Well, I acknowledge it's a tough sell, as I said, but I just think it's critical. I just don't think we have anywhere else to go. I 
I don't think I'm making something up here. I don't think I'm proposing an option with other options. I think this is a, a this is reality talking that we've got to slow down in a lot of organisations. There's no ifs or buts or maybes about it. And that if we do, then that does open up a fertile field for uh, fast IT, for, for being able to make the improvements, whether it be outsourcing or, 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 or lean or whatever we do, um, to be more nimble in the future and be more responsive and serve better in the future while still protecting our obligations and assets in the organisation. So that's what I mean by slow IT, that's what I mean by fast IT, and that's what I mean by meet in the middle. I hope you like it. Thanks.